I should have said that. Have you text you? Yeah, you know Maria's my dad. Done. Okay, hello. How are you? I hope everything is working. Um, what I'm going to do to you, oh, thank you, Maria. That was lovely. And thank you for watching. Uh, thank you for coming and enjoying this benefit for the Freedom School. Um, what I'm going to do today is do a couple readings. I'm going to do, I think, four pieces. One, two, three or five pieces. Um, the last one is a story um, by Cadwell Turnbull and the three of the other pieces are by me and one of them that I'm going to start off with is Shuggy Otis from the album Freedom Fight. So I'm going to read that first and then I'm going to talk about the context of the things that I'm reading. Um, unfortunately at the beginning of the pandemic, I dropped my laptop on on its face, and so I am using multiple a monitor and my laptop to do this, so I'm going to have to look away to do my readings. But stay with me. Here we go. This is Strawberry Letter 23 by Shuggy Otis from the album Freedom Flight. <laughs> Hello, my love. I heard a kiss from you. Red magic satin playing near too. All through the morning, rain, I gaze, the sun doesn't shine. Rainbows and waterfalls run through my mind. In the garden I see west purple shower bells and tea. Orange birds and rivers cousins dressed in green. Pretty magic I hear, sorry, pretty music I hear, so happy and loud. Blue flowers echo from a cherry cloud. Feel sunshine sparkle pink and blue. Playgrounds will laugh if you try to ask, is it cool? If you arrive and don't see me, I'm going to be with my baby. I'm free flying in her arms over the sea. Stained windows, yellow, candy screen, sea speakers of kite, with velvet roses digging freedom flight. A present from you, Strawberry Letter 22. The music plays and I sit in for a few. Okay, is everything working? It looks jumpy on the end, but... Okay, it might be jumpy. I have no idea. Okay. I hope it's not too jumpy. I have no idea what's happening out there. Great. Looks, sounds good. Um, so, I read that because I have been thinking of what's next. Um, what to do next. Um, what to be next and how to create work next. I've been thinking about the moment. The moment of now the moment of what happens next and how to create work in that moment um so i think i want to share a couple things that i created in this time since the beginning of the pandemic um and something that i wrote right before the pandemic that i think kind of relates um, i'm going to read the lyrics but i'm also going to include the samples, uh, the text from the samples. Um, this first piece that I'm going to read um, is something that I wrote several months ago um, called The Body is Electric for the Black Monument Ensemble. And it starts with a sample. Um, uh, voices uh, Walter Palmer and Maddie L. Humphrey um, speak from a panel discussion 
that's from the late 60s, early 70s that appeared on a Philadelphia morning show, Community Exchange Center. The show is called Input. <clears throat> Time is running out. Exactly. I think that it's running out for the people that cannot see themselves as being a part of the human experience and the new human endeavor. So what you're saying is you must use the moment in depth because you can't stretch it out on either end and that time is just the difference between knowing now and knowing nothing. And if you know now fully, it's past, present, and future. But sometimes what happens is you get caught up, so caught up in the daily rigors of running, jumping, and racing that you don't have time to see that you're not going anywhere. Let's bring the drums back. Okay, so the lyrics for body is electric. Picture all we know. Shift the land and the rivers flow from gray to bold. Listen close to the stories told and we know what's in our reach. And behind us is a crowded street. It's a movement thing. The brass is stuttering. Sha la 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 la. The body is electric, alive with life. <clears throat> Verse two. Picture all we know. People moving in slow motion though. Tensions hum below. Nothing like all the stories told. And we know what's in our reach. And behind us is a crowded street. It's a movement thing. The brass is stuttering. Sha la 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 la. The body is electric, alive with life. That song was a song that I wrote in the fall after um, all the material was written <clears throat> for, and the album uh, Where Future Unfolds came out. It was the first song I wrote after that. And I was picturing a movement, a crowd, um, knowing that the body is electric and that we can move things forward. So we, um, we know what's in our reach and behind us is a crowded street. It's a movement thing. Um, so I've been really thinking about where to go from here. Um, and I wrote a new song that I wanted to share. I haven't shared it with anyone, so I'm sharing it with you. Um, this song is called Now. Uh, now, Forever Momentary Space. And this was, I finished that, I finished this this past week. Um, and I've been trying to write a new song for three months now, and this is the first one I wrote, and it kind of addresses this idea of like what to do in this moment. And at the end, there's a sample, and I'll, I'll, I'll read the sample uh, and give credit to the sample at the end. Okay, so this is called Now Forever Momentary Space. <clears throat> Melodies in gold dipped in sunlight. Levitating song, laughter, delight. You can see it all, universal insight. You can see it now, spectrum brilliant and bright. The instant people take flight. Come to speak your peace, mother of time. Rotation of the dial, revive the life. You can free it all, lighten their eyes. You can free it now. See nobody dies beyond the timeline. Shades of night and gold, green, crimson, and black call into the twilight. The curtain pulls back. You can know it all with language in place. You can know it all with rhythm and grace, forever momentary space. And the song's going to end with a sample from a film called The Bus Is Coming. Um, and here's a sample. I was with you and we were places that we've never been before. 
and we were just running, you know, like through a green forest, just laughing and dancing. And the trees turned into a million people. We just kept laughing and dancing and telling them how much we loved each other. What did you see? That sample comes from uh, the film, The Bus Is Coming, from 1971. Um, the theme or the story of that film is um, about a Vietnam veteran who comes back to his old neighborhood in Watts, and his brother has been killed at the hand of two racist police officers, and he becomes the unlikely voice of moderation between the enraged black militants who want to ride in the streets and the violent white extremists who are just inciting a race war. So <clears throat> what I was thinking about with now forever momentary time space is just that having access to that moment, that moment to change, that moment to do, that moment to create. And so <clears throat> I decided that now was that moment, you know, and now was a time outside of the timeline. It's forever momentary space so that we can always live in this moment that is that all things are possible. Um, uh, the next thing I'm going to read is a piece that I did in response to a prompt that I gave my students at Stateville um, through the program, uh, Prison and Neighborhood Arts Project. I teach an art class and we're doing a comics class at Stateville. And uh, it was a four panel, the assignment was a four panel, <coughs> excuse me, a four panel comic on the theme of liberation. It's a conversation with yourself about liberation it does the, the the person in the comic doesn't have to look like you. You can have tons of characters in it. You can have one character in it. Anyway, I wanted to share that because that was made also in the same time period of me trying to figure out how to move forward to create work in this moment. So I'm going to share the liberation comic with you. So I'm going to show you the images too. Okay. What does liberation look like? I want to know. I suppose I should be able to envision something like that, but it's hard to picture something I've never seen. What does a ghost do when it's not scaring people? What does the room look like when the lights go out? That's where I am. Hopefully, shapes will form and I will be able to picture the unknown. Liberation is a place of raging oceans and pyramids. Every atom and particle breathes and moves with solid solidarity. Excuse me. Every atom and particle breathes and moves in solidarity with love. Hatred is thy enemy. We see through it. It is the future. Liberation in, is inextricably linked to policing, race, law, access, education, and opportunity. These factors decide who survives this world. Liberation is locked away from most and can't be reached by force. The chains that contain it were forged when this country was built. Is there a light in a dark city called liberation. So yeah, that comic, the first three panels I got done <coughs> rather quickly, and then the last panel took me forever. <sighs> okay, so I want to share with you a short story by Cadwell Turnbull, because I think that it really, it really stuck in my imagination. I just thought it was really brilliant, you know? I was listening to um, LeVar Burton Reads with my partner Tara, 
and we chose this song, uh, this sorry, this story for him to read to us. And uh, wow, it was just beautiful. And I think that really explores this moment of possibility and like sets a stage for allowing something new to happen and how that can be crushed or admired or, you know, or found. So if you can stick with me for another 15 minutes, I'm going to read Jump by Cadwell Turnbull. Cadwell Turnbull is a graduate from the North Carolina State University's Creative Writing MFA in Fiction and English MA in Linguistics. He was the winner of 2014's NCSU Prize for Short Fiction and attended Clarion West in 2016. I just thought I would share all that information since I'm going to read his story. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> this is Jump by Cadwell Turnbull. You ready? Let me clear my throat, take a sip of water. <coughs> okay, as LeVar Burton says, let's take a breath. Exhale. And let's begin. Mike and Jesse were walking in the park. The trees high above their heads stretched to touch each other, their leaves letting only the tiniest slivers of light through. Mike watched the freckles of light spot Jesse's brown face, her skirt, her arms. He tried to snub them out with his fingers. It was a long day for them. They had spent a few hours walking around the park, just talking about the old dreams, the new ones, and the new ones, black riots and urban decay, the secrets of their hearts and the mysteries of the universe. The time Mike introduced himself through a mutual friend and his palms were so clammy that Jesse knew immediately how nervous he was. They had always talked a lot. Mike was amazed that they had always found something to say. It was a little less than two years, but he thought once grad school was over, he would ask. He thought she'd say yes. They made another lap around the park, but by the time they decided they needed to walk back home, a full 45 minutes away, they were way too tired to make the journey. They considered a cab, but Mike had a better idea. Why don't we teleport, he asked. What, now? She laughed. She was giving him that smile that, gave, that she gave when, she was, when he was talking crazy, that would spread across her face, her eyes wide, her, her eyebrows raised in steep arches. Hold my hand, he said. He didn't wait. He grabbed her hand himself. We can do it. What makes you think we can teleport, she asked. I believe, he said simply. She laughed at him again. You're crazy. Mike didn't know how far he was going to take this, but it was Jesse, and he didn't worry about seeming silly. Close your eyes and picture home, he said. On the count of three, we will jump forward, and we will be there. <clears throat> He looked at Jesse, and sure enough, she closed her eyes. <laughs> Hold on a second. Okay. He looked at Jesse, and sure enough, she closed her eyes. She was smiling, and he wished he could read her thoughts, but that was another power entirely. One, he said. He tightened his grip on her hand. Two, he felt a warmth in his stomach. His knees were bent. He was extra aware of the grass beneath his feet. Three, he leapt and felt Jesse leap with him, their bodies synchronized. They were in the air for no, no more than two seconds, and when they landed, their feet hitting the ground at the same time, there wasn't the familiar soft crunch of grass. There was a hard thump on their feet against the pavement. When they opened their eyes, they realized they were home. Jessie looks back on that day often. She remembers how weak her knees felt once they had made the jump. He had to hold her up to keep her from toppling over. She remembers his face, the flashes of abject terror, shock, and euphoria. And she remembers the warmth in her belly, like she was glowing from the inside. She remembers her neighbor Greg from 34C halfway up the stairs to their apartment building when they arrived out of nowhere. 
Oh, I didn't see you two there, he said, turning when he heard Mike's joyous scream. Everything okay? He looked from Mike to her to Mike again. Holy shit, Mike said, as if in answer. And then more screams. Jessie's sitting on the couch, reliving the moment, her legs pressed under her, an open book in her lap. Mike walks into the room. We should try again, he says. Jessie glares at him. If Jessie agrees, this will be the 20th time they've tried. They've all been failures. Mike keeps a calendar where he crosses off the days since it happened. Many markers are kept in the attempt to keep the record. The markers start out strong with brilliant, confident lines, and then they sputter and falter, and only the blood crawling squeak against the paper remains. Mike tries many colors, blue, red, green, magenta. The ink runs out of all of them and still no jump. The first dozen attempts are at the park, trying to find the right spot. Wearing the right clothes, Jesse must always be on the right side. They try time of day, it must always be late afternoon. They try the weather, the day must be cool and clear. Mike recites the exact words to himself. He writes it down. He puts the words next to the calendar on the wall. He remembers Jesse's words too. They must all be perfect. They must go back to the park and relive the experience word for word. When they do this, they sound like a play, play actors reciting lines. Why don't we teleport, Mike asks. Jessie rolls her eyes. What now? She asks, and the laugh is hollow, mocking. You're not trying. You have to really try. Jesus, Mike. Now we have to start over. Soon after that, Jeff, Jessie refuses to go back to the park. But Mike keeps asking to try in other places, at home, when they go out to the restaurants, at the movies, Jessie obliges, but each time her shoulders slump a little lower. She hates it. She hates it so much. You're killing me, she says. Why does this matter so much? Why wouldn't it matter, Mike says. What would matter more? A day later, he asks her again. And she almost throws a book at him, pulling back at the last moment. Leave it alone, Mike. Can't you just leave it alone? Sometimes Mike wonders if he imagined it. But it can't be. Jesse was there. He gets suspicious of the whole thing. He gets so suspicious of the whole thing that he starts to wonder if Jesse is a figment of his imagination. When his friend Alex come over, comes over for dinner, Mike tries to confirm his suspicions while Jesse's in the kitchen. I'm married to a woman about this high, right? Light brown eyes, dark skin, can be a little judgy sometimes. He says the last part a little softer than the rest. Alex just looks at him. Mike waits for an answer, the cold doubt creeping up in his spine. That was a great dinner, Jay, Alex says, looking past Mike, and then looks back at Mike and points at him with his fork. You fucked up. Mike turns and sees his wife. He has no idea how long she's been standing there, but she makes a face at him that he has come to know well, and he knows that she knows that this is about the jump again. You're welcome, Alex, she says, and leaves the dining room. It isn't that Jesse doesn't care about the jump. She just sees it differently than Mike. This thing wasn't supposed to happen. It was an accident of the universe. To want it to happen more than once in one life is crazy, isn't it? What would be the odds? And why would you need it to happen again? How practical is teleporting if you can't predict it? It's a silly thing, really. A silly little thing. Yet Jessie still looks back on the day in amazement. Sometimes, in rare moments, she relives it. It is special because of its elusiveness. Because it doesn't explain itself. For her, it is damn near divine. And she finds it empowering to have experienced it. She is a, she is a small order of who she is a small order who knows a secret. She and Mike have glimpsed behind the curtain. They have a precious knowledge. Shouldn't it bring them closer together? She tries to talk to him about her thoughts, but it seems to just excite him in an unhealthy obsession. We should keep trying. Try and master it. 
No, she says. And it isn't a rebuttal of the idea itself. She just doesn't want to master it. She likes it where it is, something distant to look at only when needed. She doesn't want it to be her life. It is just a jump, a beautiful jump, yes, but it doesn't deserve worship. Worship ruins all the best things. <clears throat> Mike wants to tell everybody. He thinks about telling his friend Alex, yo, I teleported, man. Once with Jesse, I jumped from the park straight to my house. Al, you remember that movie about teleportation you hated, Jumper? Was that it? Yeah, well, me and Jesse, we did that. But it never sounds right. He thinks about telling people on the street. He thinks about screaming it from the window of their apartment. I teleported! He did try that once. So what? The neighborhood, the neighbor yelled back. Well, he said he couldn't think of a good answer. Then a day comes where Mike walks into the room and his calendar has been taken down. He looks around and finds it in the trash bin next to his work desk. You threw my calendar away? He asked Jesse a moment later. Jessie is reading a book on the couch, her legs folded under her. She looks up at him and, and he can feel what's coming. Stop counting, she says. I'm tired of you counting. Weeks later, she walks in on him, standing in the middle of the bedroom. His knees are bent. His arms are in front of him like he's getting ready to box. His hands are bunched into his fists. His hands are bunched into fists. His face is full of lines, scrunched up in a deliberate concentration. What are you doing, she asks. He looks at her embarrassed. Nothing, he says. Yeah, she says, right. Mike believes he has to, a lot to be angry about. Jesse doesn't care about the things that matter to him. She doesn't try to understand where he's coming from, how much he needs the calendar and the hope. <clears throat> Sometimes he wonder, excuse me, Sometimes he wonders why he stayed. It is a big question for most couples, but it is an even bigger question for Mike. He wonders if it's because of the jump or because of the love. He knows he loves her. This has never changed over all the years and the fights and the makeups. But he keeps thinking, maybe he stayed because she was there when the miracle happened. Maybe he hopes that if the miracle happens again, it will all be worth it. The years, the fights, the makeups. Love doesn't always keep you where you're supposed to be, but the miracle might have. Maybe all that's left is the miracle. This is the this thought scares him. Why does it even matter so much? He doesn't know, but he feels it every day. He comes home from work and he thinks of the jump. He is chilling with his friends and the jump pops in and out of his consciousness. He is holding his wife and the jump is there, hanging in front of his eyes like an existential carrot he cannot re catch. He looks at his life and there's the jump, an island unto itself, surrounded by an ocean of monotony. Even when he is in a big moment, on the crest of some big wave, he can look out and see the island. It calls to him, but he knows he cannot get there and it laughs at him, vicious searing laughter. I'll make it up to you, Mike says. He has forgotten their anniversary again. Sure you will, she says. It's not that she cares so much about these things. She's not that kind of sentimental. In fact, that it is a fact that for years, Mike has religiously crossed off each day on the calendar. Mike's hand is on her chest, right above her breast. He follows the rise and fall of each breath. His hand light on her skin. I'm sorry, he says. Jessie's pissed. Why? She thinks, because you've let this thing get so big, there isn't any room for anything else. This stupid little thing. But then she thinks there is something deeper in his apology, beyond the forgetting. She thinks that he is saying sorry for many things, for all he has ever done that, that can't be undone. She doesn't know if she's right. So many things go unsaid between them. But more importantly, she doesn't want the truth to ruin the joy she feels in this moment. This moment that she believes that Mike is better than he actually is. Because reality is arbitrary. Because it doesn't matter as much as the feeling. And she doesn't have enough good feelings to let one slip away. She tries to sleep, but Mike's hand feels heavy on her chest now. 
It's hard to sleep under so much weight, under this nagging feeling at the edge of her consciousness. That this is the rest of their lives, dancing around this little thing, forever, just out of reach, pulling at them. They've been married for four years, and she's already breaking. What will, what will, the, what will be left after four decades? It will always need to be fed. There will always, it will always be need to be fed. It will always need to be fed, even when they are both trying to ignore that it's there, because these things take up too much space. There's no equivalency, no end to the feeding of these little monsters. Jesse takes Mike's hand off her chest and turns away from him. I said I was sorry, he says. I will make it up to you, I promise. But Jesse says nothing. Her breathing is only, her breathing is the only thing punctuating the silence, this silence at the end of things. Jesse is thinking of leaving. Mike knows this. There are so many regrets, but it's too late for regrets. He's thinking of the jump even now, but it's swirled in there with the guilt. All the things he was unable to do for Jesse, the man he was unable to be. He still wants it, but now he wishes he could close his eyes and zero in on that want with his mind and send it off somewhere dist to a distant planet where it cannot hurt them anymore. But that seems even more impossible than that day so long ago. In the end, if Jesse leaves, there will be nothing but the jump, and he doesn't want to be alone with it. It will destroy him. The old cliche of the light at the end of the tunnel, Mike laughs at it now. It is a fiction. There is light where he is. It is dim. It continues to dim. But there is no light ahead of him. All he sees is darkness. Two months after Mike and Jesse split, he returns to the apartment to pick up a stack of books Jesse decided were his and for and an old fedora he had left behind. These are the final remnants of their shared world, the last excuse for them to see each other ever again. <clears throat> Jesse meets Mike at the door, looks him up and down. He has dark circles under his eyes. He hasn't cut his hair in weeks, it seems. A, matter, a matted and unkempt beard covers the lower half of his face. Let's do it again, Mike says. What? Jesse looks at him for a long time. The question is rhetorical. She's heard him. She just hasn't decided what she'll do. One last time for the road. Mike works... Mike waits for her to reject his offer, or to get angry, or roll her eyes at him, or slam the door in his face. But she doesn't do any of that. Okay, she says. Okay? He says, surprised and relieved. Okay. Close your eyes and picture home. She closes her eyes. This is the last time ever, she tells herself. A goodbye gift in honor of the thing that destroyed their lives. But even as she is thinking this, she can feel something frozen inside, thawing against her will. He believes then that she still trusts him, a trust he thought she'd thrown away. And this gives him all the strength he needs to try again. He reaches out and grabs her hand. One, he says. He holds her hand tighter. Jesse can feel all the hope in his grasp, all the want. And she surprises herself by responding, gripping his hand tighter as well. This shocks Mike, and he feels his stomach tighten. Two, he says. They gasp aloud. This time feels different somehow. They can feel their hands merging. They can feel the combination of all the times they tried and failed, and all the times they were too scared or angry to try. They feel their collective moment, a vibrating corporality, that squeezes tight around them, pulsing. They feel the release of Earth's gravity. There's nothing to hold on to, nothing but each other, and it's perfect. It feels right. They can feel the hope of something beyond what they know. They can feel the universe as a solid living thing, calling to them, urging them forward. They say the last part together. Jesse's voice, unusually powerful. Mike as loud as a trumpet blasting over an ocean of years. Three. That was Jump by Cadwell Turnbull. And I know I've gone a little bit over time, but thank you for listening. 
and I hope that you have a wonderful day.